Okay, good morning everyone. How is everyone this morning? Good? All right, great. Thank you all for coming out to the Madison County Public Library this morning. We are so happy that you are here to see one of our great summer performances that we have this summer. How many of you have signed up for summer reading? Raise your hand. Well, you know what? There is still plenty of time to sign up for summer reading. It's very easy. All you have to do is write your name, take a summer reading card, read whatever you want, turn it in, and we give you a free book for your first card. And every card after that, we put your name into a drawing of some free prizes. So we have all sorts of good things happening this summer. One thing I would like to mention, though, is that this Friday is the due date for our summer poster reception. So our summer poster uh, showcase that we're having. So if you have decorated a poster, please turn it in by this Friday. And then next week, we're going to have a reception for those posters. So everyone that turns in a poster gets a free pool pass, a day pass to the pool. And we also put your poster up on the wall in our children's area for the rest of the year. Uh, my last announcement that I would like to make is we are partnering with Spotlight Theater this summer. And they are doing a show called Into the Woods Junior. And we're going to do a drawing this Thursday for tickets to see Into the Woods Junior. It's for two tickets on their final weekend. So that's happening on July 6th, 7th, or 8th. And you can pick the day and the time that you want to go. Just uh, have that drawing on Thursday. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Tristan. Tristan, he is from Animal Tale. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you guys very much. I'm very excited to be here. Like you said, um, I, my name is Tristan, Tristan Arms. I'm from Animal Tales. Animal Tales is a company that does animal programs. We do, we are going to do over 1,500 programs this year. I'm very excited that you guys will be one of them. We do different programs throughout the year. We've got four going on right now. But this one is Born to be Wild. I think it's got some of the coolest animals on it. Some of you are very excited to meet you. Um, so, the show Born to be Wild is all about animals with a musical connection. It's all about animals that make noise, all right? So, before we get to that, a little bit about us. For a company that does animal presentations, we're based out of Kingston Springs, Tennessee, right outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, yeah. We are going to travel to over 17 states this year. Um, our show next year, is Creatures of the Galaxy. It's all about creatures and animals that have been to space before. It's going to be a really cool one. All right? And all of our shows have different um, animals in it each year. We do shows in libraries and churches and schools and community centers. Um, we even do birthday parties. We do some really cool birthday parties. If any of you are interested in that, you can check us out on our website, animaleducation.com. If any of the adults want to come up afterwards and pick up one of these cards, it's got all of our information. All right? But do you guys want to get into the show? Yes. Yeah? All right. Enough talking. Okay. So, animals with a musical connection. We don't always think of animals as making music, right? A lot of times they just make noise. Especially when it's the dog at 2 in the morning and he's barking at nothing and you just want to go to bed. That's not music. That's just noise. But there are some animals that do make music, that make noises that we think sounds like music. Maybe dinosaurs made music, we don't really know. There are some birds, actually most birds today, when they make noise, we call it a song, a bird song. And it kind of sounds like music. When whales talk to each other, we call it singing, a whale song. All right, there are some animals that make instrument noise. Can any of you tell me what instrument an elephant sounds like? All right, a trumpet, very good. All right, like we practiced beforehand, I want to do the, the raise hand and sit still. All right, so elephants make a trumpeting noise. They can also make another type of noise, a type of noise that we can't hear. All right, they can make a noise called infrasonic or subsonic, which means that it's so low that we can't pick it up with our ears. Instead, we pick it up in our bodies. It vibrates the air in our lungs, and it'll shake your chest, but you can't hear it in your ear. It also shakes the ground underneath the elephant. And they can use that to communicate with other elephants up to six miles away. 
If another elephant was picking up that one, you could see it lean down and put its trunk on the ground and pick one of its feet up onto a toe, and that would help it pick up the vibrations from the ground. All right? So, I've got some even cooler animals with me today, and you guys are going to get to see all of them. But before we get started, one more thing. I want to go over a couple rules. Two rules, all right? Raise your right hand. All right. I will respect my friends and be brave. Very brave. Forever and ever. All right. That's a binding contract. The two rules, very important. The first one, respect my friends. This one's super important. We've got a lot of people here today, and that's fantastic. But I want to make sure everybody gets as good as a presentation as everyone else. So we need to be quiet so that everyone can hear. And we need to sit still and stay seated so that everyone can see and doesn't get distracted. Does that sound good? All right. I bet you guys can do that. Second rule, be brave. I am going to ask for some volunteers today. I'm really brave. Yeah? So I'm going to ask for some volunteers today. People to come up, maybe hold, maybe pet, maybe touch an animal. All right? If I call on you, you need to be super brave. And on that note, let's get started with some volunteers. All right? These volunteers need to be brave. They need to be prone not to dropping things. All right? Let's go. You ma'am? Yes? You ma'am? You sir? Yes. You. Yeah? All right. You want to come be a volunteer? All right. All right. All right. All right. So, you want to be a volunteer? Okay. Okay. Here, sir. Will you? All right, so what I'm going to have you guys do is stand up here in front of the table. You guys are lucky. You get to keep your eyes open. All right? All right, you guys can stand up here in front of the table. Just the volunteers, please. All right? Stand up here, line up in front of the table. All right? You're going to look this way. You guys are lucky. You get to keep your eyes open. All right? So, before we get started, um... Pop quiz. Who knows what an invertebrate is? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. It's got no bones. Very good. An invertebrate literally means very good. Yes. An invertebrate means that you have no backbone. There are some animals without backbones, without any bones at all. Do you know that the octopus has got a hard beak, like a bird, kind of like a parrot's beak? But besides that, it's got no other bones in its body. It's just muscle and skin. There are other animals that are invertebrates that do have hard parts of their body. They're called exoskeletons. Those parts give them protection, like a suit of armor, from animals in the wild that would want to eat them. But inside the exoskeleton, there are no bones at all. It's just soft organs and stuff. All right? Animals like that are like crabs and clams and the type of animal that makes up 75% of the species on Earth, insects, all right? And that's what our friends up here are going to be holding today. All right? Yeah, crabs are pretty dangerous, all right? So, we want to keep the talking down until I call on you so that we can get through this quick and you guys get to see all the animals. Does that make sense? All right, so... You guys are going to be holding the insect. You're all still up here? All right. We lose a couple when I say that during the presentation. So what I'm going to have you guys do is look forward. You're going to hold your hands out like this, cup them out like this. I'm going to bring around a little box. You guys are going to, I'm going to put one in each of your hands. This animal cannot sting. It cannot light. It's not going to dance. It's not going to fly. All right? You'll be just fine. Yeah? All right. But I forward. I forward. Hissing cockroach. <laughs> Alright. These guys, these guys live in, can you guys guess? Not very good. They live in Madagascar. What? Yeah, it's part of their name. So, there are over 4,000 species. 
species of cockroach in the world. 30 of them like to live among humans, and luckily for the moms of Madagascar, these are not one of those 30. You wouldn't find those in your pantry in Madagascar. Instead, these guys like to live in rotten logs or wet dirt underground. All right? And that's where they use their other, the other part of their name. Not over cockroach, not over Madagascar. They don't bite, they don't sting, all right? They can't even fly. It looks like a wiggle. Yep. All right. The last part of their, the last part of their name is hissing. All right. Okay. The last part of their name is hissing. That's their special noise. Their music. So, can you guys make a hissing noise? All right. Very good. So, that's enough. You guys are great. Okay. So, when I do this, we need to be quiet and patient. All right. You guys are very good at that. All right. So, these guys make a hissing noise. But they don't make the hissing noise with their mouth. When we make a hissing noise, we expel air out of our lungs. We make a shape with our mouth, and it makes the hiss. These guys don't have lungs. They can't hiss with their mouths because they don't have lungs. Instead, they've got holes on the side of their body called spiracles, all right? They run along their abdomen down the sides. Those holes are what they use to breathe. They lead into cells that absorb oxygen and expel carbon dioxide. And when they want to hiss, they push all the air out of those holes really quick. And those holes are kind of like whistles. And if they push the air out fast enough, it makes a hissing sound, a whooshing sound. All right? The reason they do this in the wild is to scare away predators. So, if there was a colony of 50 or 60 of them living in a log in Madagascar, and then say a ring-tailed lemur comes up, the lemur comes up and pulls off the top of the log, um, trying to find some food. What these guys would do is all 60 of them would start hissing at once. All right, that would make a big whooshing noise to scare away the predator. Does that make sense? No. All right. So, do we have any questions about the hissing time? As a scary predator. Well, the predator opens the log, thinking it's going to find some like grubs or maybe a few cockroaches, but instead it finds 60 and they all make a big whooshing noise. They think it was some sort of weird creature that was making like a, a hiss or something. So that's how it scares away a predator. Another question? Yes, ma'am. These guys will eat just about anything. Back at Animal Tales headquarters, we feed them mostly uh, cardboard, which they seem to really enjoy. Um, you can... We've, we've got a colony of maybe 20, and we can put a, un, like a used egg carton in there, and they will survive on that for months and months. Right. We'll do one more question. Anybody? Yes, sir. What? They eat ghosts? They don't like meat. They'll eat, they eat like trash. They'll even eat glue and stuff. They eat like, oh, like grass and stuff? Yeah, kind of like that. They eat what they can find. They're really good at digestion. All right. Let's give our volunteers a round of applause. Our next animal, I need another volunteer. All right, you sir, yes. All right, I said her first volunteer so lucky because we got things that arrived open. That would make you one more. What I'm gonna have you do, we'll just have one volunteer. All right, you're gonna stand in front of the table. I'm gonna have you close your eyes and you're gonna put one hand out like this. I'm gonna bring out the next animal and run it underneath your hand and watch you tell through, okay? All right? So you guys aren't allowed to give it away when I pull them out.
daily. All right, open your eyes. All right, this is Tank. Can you guys say hi, Tank? Hi, Tank. Tank is a Sudan plated lizard. All right? These guys like to live in Sudan, um, down in the deserts where it's hot and dry. Um, they have a special type of scale on their back. Just like all reptiles, they have scales. But these scales take a very special appearance. Do you see what's weird about their scales? What is, what's, what's different about it? Yeah? What's weird about the shape of the scales? They're all square and pointy. This guy's scales make little lines across the back. Actually, they look kind of like the plates on an armadillo. They're these separate plates that all fold up on top of each other and make the back um, and the entire upper part of this guy's body. He uses this for protection against predators, all right? These scales give him special protection and another special purpose that we'll get to in a second. So, this guy's special noise he uses to scare away predators. But he doesn't make his noise with his mouth. He's got lungs, unlike the cockroach, but he doesn't use his mouth. Instead, he makes the noise with his tail, all right? If he gets scared, he's trying to scare away a predator, what he'll do is he'll crawl into the brush, maybe some leaves or twigs or sand, and he'll start to shake his tail around really, really fast. What that does is it makes noise. Now, unlike a rattlesnake, he doesn't have little balls in his tail that wrap around him noise. He relies on what's around him to make noise. If you shake your hand in like a bunch of twigs or a bush, it'd make a rattling sound. And that's what this guy does with his tail. Hopefully that's enough to scare away a predator. But if that doesn't work, he's got a plan B. Alright? I want you to feel down here at the end of the tail. Alright? I'm trying to rub your finger the other way. What's wrong? It's like stabby. He's got little spikes. Down here where the plates get to the end of the tail, they get really sharp on the edge, like spines. Not enough to poke in the skin if you were trying to rub the wrong way, um, like I asked. But it is enough to hurt, especially if this guy's using Plan B. What he does is he picks his tail up and he'll whip it in the face of a predator, trying to hit them in the head or in the face to scare away the predator. If you were going for a meal and you ended up getting hit in the face, you might re decide on like, where you were going to eat. Does that make sense? All right. But that doesn't always work. If that doesn't work, he's got a plan C, all right? His plan C is to drop his tail. When he wants to, if he feels threatened, right around here, past the back two legs, he can let go of his tail, and it'll fall off. It doesn't even have to be pulled off. It'll just separate. He leaves his tail on the ground, and the tail will continue to thrash around like it was before. All right? The tail will keep wiggling around, and that should give this guy enough of a distraction to run away and hide. Whatever predator was fighting him will get distracted by the tail. Maybe he'll try to eat it. Maybe he'll try to fight it. And this guy can run away and hide somewhere so he gets to live another day. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's super cool. So, this guy's about three years old. If you were to drop his tail now, which I really hope he doesn't, but if you were to drop his tail now, it would take him about three years to grow it back to this size. And then he would be six and his tail would be three and so it still wouldn't fit him perfectly. These guys can live to about 10 years old and they'll grow every day of their life. Just like all reptiles actually. All reptiles grow every day of their life. They never stop growing. It's the only thing that stunts about is growth. All right? When he's fully grown, he can be about two to three feet in length. Um, and he'll eat just about anything he can get a hold of. Bugs, fish, other lizards, other reptiles like snakes. He'll eat just about anything he can grab, even though he likes meat, unlike the cop. All right? We'll do a couple questions about tank. Yes, ma'am? I'm not going to let everybody pet this guy, um, just for time's sake. However, if we're good and we get done on time, and everybody's super polite and respectful of their friends, I do have an animal that we can pet afterwards that everyone can pet. All right? One more question about tank. Yes, ma'am? Super important to wash your hands. So I'm going to have you do it. 
hand sanitizer up here. Animals carry diseases and germs on them that we don't come into contact every day, so we're not resistant to them. The animals are fine, they live with them all the time, so they don't get affected by it, but we can get really sick. Most reptiles actually carry salmonella on them, the same thing as raw chicken, which is why if you guys have seen some of those chicken with raw chicken, they always wash their hands. All right, so, do you wash your hands? All right, let's give our volunteer a round of applause. That's very good. All right. So, you guys heard what was chirping in here earlier? We thought it was a bird. I told someone a raccoon was pretty close. Do you want to see what he is? All right. Do any of you have any baby brothers or baby sisters? Yeah. All right. I'm not not going to volunteer, but this is a baby brother. Can you guys say hi, Charlie? Cotamundi, all right? These guys live in the rainforest, up in the canopy of the trees in South America, all right? They're very good at crawling around. They like to live up in the canopy, so they've got really sharp claws to dig into bark or shirts. Um, they also have another special ability. You guys will take your hand, raise your hand like this, all right, without twisting your uh, wrist or twisting your arm. Tilt your hand side to side like this, all right? We can tilt our hand about 90 degrees side to side. This guy can tilt each of his feet 180 degrees. This helps him to hold on to vines and the branches and the shoulders so that he doesn't fall off. All right, and as you can see, he's pretty active. He needs to not fall off. All right, he can move another part of his body really good. All right, listen to that. We'll get back to that in a minute. All right. So, he can, tilt his, he can tilt his nose side to side. We can barely tilt our nose at all. But he can tilt his nose from left to right 60 degrees. This helps him out in the wild when he's trying to find food. He's being bottle fed right now. But when, he does, when he's an adult, he'll eat nuts and berries and fruits. All right? And in the wild, he goes down into the canopy floor to root around in the dirt. He'll dig around in the dirt with his nose to find the food that he has. Does that make sense? All right. So, this guy's special noise. You guys heard him chirping earlier, like a bird or a mouse. When he's fully grown, he can make all sorts of noise. He can make grunts and whistles and snorts. He's like a pig, all right? So, they use these noises to communicate with other Kodamundi. They travel in bands of up to 10 to 15 Kodamundi, and they use these noises to communicate with one another. These guys are super, super smart. They can have a whole bunch of emotions and convey them. If you're a really well-trained handler, you can even tell what they're feeling by the noises they make and how they're acting. All right? So, another way they communicate with one another is by scent. Every coat of money has what's called a musk gland. They have a musk gland on their neck and on their belly that secretes a special smell. Every coat of money in a band has a different smell that they'll use, a different smell that they can use to tell other coat of money apart. Each of them's got a special smell, and any other coat of money can smell them, and then they'll know what coat of money is. All right? Can we climb down? All right? That was a good question. What if you were to get down and get on someone? Right. Most of the animals I have today are very used to being with physicians. Actually, all of them are used to being with physicians. Um, they're not tamed animals. They're not domestic, like a dog or a cat at home. But they are kind of used to handlers. What that means is if you know how to deal with them and you treat them with respect, they aren't mean and they treat you with respect. But if they were to get scared or spooked, or if they were uncomfortable or felt like they were in danger, they would fall back on their wild instincts and they could lash out. This guy's got very sharp claws and very sharp teeth, and they get bigger and sharper as he grows older. All right, so I'm not gonna let him down uh, to see you guys because he might get scared. He doesn't have to deal with that many people. So, I said they were really smart, right? Okay, I've got a story 
we've got three of these little guys back at home, um, and then we've got one adult back at Animal Tales headquarters. All right, the adult's name is Ringo, and I've got a story about him. We built we built the new habitat for Ringo um, a couple of years ago, and the handler had just gone in to feed Ringo. He put new food in there, and we just put a new lock on Ringo's habitat. All right, the lock was a maze we had to memorize. The first time he went in there, the handler undid the maze, left. Within 30 seconds, Ringo had hopped up, undid the lock, opened the door. He went and jumped up on the presenter's shoulder and bit onto his ear. He took the presenter over to the fridge, where the presenter got him a piece of fruit. Then Ringo took the fruit and ran back into his house. All right, and he hid in the corner while he ate because he knew he did something wrong. These guys are super, super smart. All right, do you have any questions about money? Yes, do they make pets? All right, they don't make good pets. <laughs> <laughs> they don't make very good pets. Like I said, these guys aren't domesticated like a cat or a dog. Um, if they were to get scared, if they were to get scared of spooks, yeah. they could lash out and fall back and be wild animals. They could be back. Yes, sir. The tail gets longer and longer, but it grows. The tail does get longer. The adult, uh, Rago, that we have back at headquarters. All right. I need my arm back. Okay. Maybe from nose to end, he's about this long, and then his tail comes out about this long, all right? They can get really big when they're adults, all right? And their, their fangs and claws grow with them, so it's another reason they don't make good pets. All right, we'll do one more question. Yes, sir. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they're very smart. They can open locks and watches and stuff. Um, and they like to take things, shiny things or materials they don't normally have. Um, and once they get something, it's very hard to get it back from. They'll, they'll fight for it. You normally have to trade with them, give them something else, and then they'll give them what they have. All right? So, everyone say bye, Cash. Bye, the towel is to cover him up. He's just a baby right now. He gets fed about every three hours. Um, and in between that, he'll sleep and play. And sleep and play and eat. Sleep and play and eat. Sleep and play and eat. So the towel is to keep it dark in case he wants to sleep. So. Our next animal is very special. I need two volunteers. So you guys have a very short shot. You need to protect the audience. Our next animal is Speedy. Alright? I've had a little bit of trouble with him in the past. You get this. You're gonna stand over here. You get this. I don't know what it's gonna do, it's just water. Um, but it's probably better than nothing. Maybe. So if you guys stand over there, I'm gonna get Speedy out. We want to make sure he doesn't get away. Okay? <laughs> Can you say hi, Speedy? Speedy is an African spurred hornet. All right? He's very big. This is actually the fourth largest species of tortoise on earth. When they're fully grown, they can be three feet long, and some of them even get longer than that. I said earlier the reptiles grow every day of their life, and that's why... All right? He can't put his head all the way in his shell like a turtle. These guys can only go a little bit back with their head and their feet. What? Probably food that he had in his... Uh, all right? So, they can't put their head and their legs all the way back to your shell, like a turtle. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. These guys can live to be very old, which is why they get so big. 
Some turtles can live up to 200 years old, and those are the really, really big ones, like the Galapagos tortoise. Those guys get so big because they get so old and they never stop growing. These guys can live to about 150 years old. All right, and actually the oldest one just had a birthday recently. She's 180. All right, the oldest spur tortoise in the world, 180 years old. And she's really big, almost four feet from top of the shell to end of the shell. Right? Super, super big. So, these guys do make a special noise. They hiss, kind of like a snake almost. They don't always make the noise, but if they're feeling scared or want to like, scare someone away, they'll make a hissing noise and they'll move their head. Now, they're not a snapping turtle. They don't snap like a snapping turtle but they can bite down. These guys do have bony meats on the front of their mouth. They can use to bite down. It's normally used to cut grass, which is what they eat. The slowest animal eats the slowest food. They eat plants and things. So they can bite down on that. They also have really weird homes. These guys can't curl up and live inside their shell. Right? Instead, they dig burrows. Can you guys see the claws? Can you guys see the claws up here? All right. They use these claws and these flat feet to dig burrows in the ground. These guys can dig a burrow that's 50 or 60 feet deep. Super, super deep. All right? And they go down and they live in these burrows to protect themselves from predators and to keep cold. These guys normally only come out at, uh, in the morning and at nighttime, which is for temperature. It's just about the perfect temperature where they live morning and night, and the rest of the time they stay in the burrow where it's nice and cold. Does that make sense? Alright, so I want you guys to come up. You can feel the shell. Tell me what it feels like. What's the shell feel like? Smooth. Alright. Do you see the rings on it? Alright, I'll try and get you guys a good look. The shell has all these different plates, and the plates have little rings all around them. All right? Do you guys see the rings? All right. Those rings are exactly the same as on a tree. As this guy grows, his shell has to grow with them, and where these plates meet, they separate and slide apart. And every time the shell separates and moves, the plates grow, and it adds a new ring. So you can tell the age of a turtle, just like you can tell the age of a tree, by the rings on the shell. All right? Do we have any questions about Speedy? Yes, ma'am. Do they have to take baths? Where these guys live, they don't normally get a lot of water. They'll normally just drink in it. They Sometimes they take dust baths. What animals will do is they'll roll around in really loose dust, really fine dust, and that'll get into all the cracks and crevices, cre cre crevices, and it'll knock out all the dirt and grime. So they can take a dust bath. They normally don't get into water. That's the difference between tortoises and, tortoises and turtles. Turtles live near and in water, and tortoises live on land. All right? One more question. Yes, sir. Okay. Why does he have bumps? Why does he have bumps on his shell? Yeah. The bumps are to help. It makes it harder for an animal to bite down on him. If it was just smooth, the animal could maybe fit his whole mouth over it. What um, the, the bumps push up against it. If an animal were to hit his a tooth or something on the bump, it would hurt. And the bumps also make spots where teeth would slide off like this. All right. One more question about Speedy. Yes, ma'am. He is pretty heavy. This is actually the uh, the lighter of the two spur tortoises we have back then. Tails head. Someone else took the heavier one, but he's a, maybe thirty or forty pounds, um, and they can get over a hundred pounds when they're fully grown. All right. Everyone say bye, Speedy. Bye, Speedy. Give a round of cheers and round of applause. You guys are watching. Thank you. Hey, can you hand sanitizer? All right, very good. Turtles and uh, tortoises are actually the worst about the salmonella. These guys are chock full of salmonella syndrome. 
um, which is one of the reasons you're told not to mess with a tortoise. Now, what? A turtle or a turtle. Because if you touch them, you were to touch your eyes or mouth, you can get very sick. But there is one reason. If you see a turtle out in the wild and it's upside down, it's not just bad for the turtle because it hurts his ego. Um, it's also bad because it makes it harder for him to breathe. Turtles' lungs are attached to the top of their shell, the inside of their shell. When they're upside down, well, when they're right side up, gravity helps to draw the lungs down to take in air. And when they're upside down, they don't have the help of gravity. Actually, gravity is working against them. So it makes it super hard for them to open their lungs up. So it can be super hard for them to breathe. So if you see a turtle in the wild and it's upside down, go get an adult. Have the adult flip the turtle over and then go wash their hands. Okay? So. Our next friend. You guys ready for the next one? Yeah. Yeah? All right. No, I won't have volunteers for this one. I'm sorry. All right. Oh, I love that. You guys say hi, Messy. Hi. All right. Bessie is a milk snake. All right. The milk snake. First of all, it's called a milk snake because there used to be legends about them that said they would steal milk from cows to make a cow's milk snake. As far as we know, those legends are untrue, but the name stuck, so they're called milk snakes. But they look very, very similar to another type of snake. They look almost identical to a coral snake. Now, coral snakes are very venomous. They're very dangerous snakes. They're aggressive and mean, and in the wild, all the predators know not to mess with a coral snake. These guys aren't coral snakes. They're milk snakes. But they look almost identical. They aren't venomous. They're not even super aggressive. But if you're a predator and you see a milk snake, you'll think it's a coral snake. And predators have learned not to mess with the coral snakes because they're dangerous and venomous. So this guy, without having to be venomous or being aggressive, gets the benefit of looking like a coral snake because all predators leave him alone. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Because he looks like a coral snake. Yeah. So do you guys see these kind of white right now? On the stuff of color, kind of ghostly? This isn't what he normally looks like. He's actually about to shed his skin. All right. He's about to shed his skin. What happens? The skin is normally pretty see-through, but he secretes a uh, white um, liquid in between his new skin and the old skin. And that liquid is what he uses to slide out of the skin. So what you're actually seeing is the liquid underneath the top layer of skin, and he's about ready to slide out of the skin. Okay. So. How does he do that? What he'll do is he'll find a rock um, or something hard that he can lean up against. And he'll hook the old skin onto it and then very slowly worm his way out of it um, and leave the old skin behind. Okay? So, this guy's special adaptation is called mimicry. That's what he uses to mimic the coral snake. And he even mimics the coral snake's hiss. Right, if you were to have both snakes side by side and both of them were to hiss, you wouldn't be able to tell which one was which. And a lot of snakes have different hisses. This guy is actually named the coral snake's hiss, which is his special sound. All right. Do we have any questions about the coral snake? Well, you can put your hand up for questions. What's your question? Do they bite? All right. They do bite. That's how they eat. These guys are constrictor, which means, or this guy is a constrictor, which means he'll wrap up around his food. Um, and then he'll try to eat it. But he doesn't normally bite people. Like all the other animals, they know that, you know, people aren't food, so we're not trying to hurt them. As long as he's kept happy, healthy, and uh, he's treated with respect, he knows not to mess with people. Um, and that's why I feel safe. Holy. All right. Any other questions? Sir. Yes. What is he hunt? This guy will eat just about anything he can get a hold of. The, what a, 
constrictor snake eats is completely dependent on its size. They can open their mouth, they've got uh, a special jaw. We open our mouths like this, the bottom jaw drops, and we can eat things without that big. This guy drops his bottom jaw and then can separate like that, which means he can fit much bigger food in his mouth. But it's still only so big. So this guy could eat maybe mice or other small snakes and reptiles, but um, when he gets bigger, he can eat even bigger things, bigger mammals, uh, bigger reptiles. All right, one more question. Yes, sir, that picture. Lots of snakes live everywhere, especially in North America, there are lots of snakes. But we never want to go up and touch a snake in the wild, okay? Um, even snakes that aren't venomous can be dangerous. If they lash out and bite you, first of all, it would hurt and it would scare you. Um, second of all, if something were to get in that skin where the bite was, you could get an infection, you could get really sick from it, which would be bad. So, we, don't, we never want to touch snakes in the wild. However, if there is a snake that a presenter maybe wanted all of you to pet, or any of you that wanted to, to pet after the program, just, you know, for example, there is a special way to pet those snakes, all right? What you do if you wanted to pet a snake like that is you take two fingers, all right, and you run away from the head down the bottom, away from the head. What that does is it goes with the lay of the scale. If you run the other way, you can accidentally catch a snail and peel it up and off, which would really hurt the snake, and it might also hurt the presenter. Um, so, you run the other way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Remember that. This is the pet animal for after the presentation. Then if you want to, after we're done, not now, but after we're done, um, you can come up and pet it, and your parents can take a picture. All right? And we'll go over that after. All right? Everyone say bye, Bessie. Bye, Bessie. super special, okay? She's a little shy. She's not used to being around people yet. So we want to be quiet and we want to be respectful so she feels well. Um, she's the rarest of her kind, the rarest breed of animal that uh, she's a part of. And she's completely extinct in the wild. They only live in captivity. They've got about 150 of them um, in captivity. They're completely extinct in the wild. Dinosaurs are extinct. They don't exist at all anymore. They don't live in the wild or in captivity. This girl, or this type of animal, is extinct in the wild, but we still have some of them in captivity. So, I'm going to see if she'll come out. Do 
You guys remember that howl we heard earlier? Yeah, that was her, all right? She howled like a coyote. Remember some of you guys said you heard coyotes? All right? Howls are how she communicates. She can make all the whines and barks and whimpers of a normal dog, but she also howls. Alright, and these howls are super special. They're not like a little These guys use their howls in a very interesting way. The first way, if you had one dog that was separated from the other, that dog would howl, and then the pack of dogs would howl, and they'd play Marco Polo until they could find each other and get back together. Alright? The second way they use their howls is a really interesting one. It's how they got their name. So, you'd have a mountain in the uh, in, uh, in Papua and maybe there are five or six families of dogs living on that mountain. Each family of dogs had five or six dogs in it, all right? And each family of dogs would have a different song, okay? So, these guys all howl. All of the dogs howl sound pretty similar. It's the same type of noise, but they can make their howl different pitches and different tones. So what they'll do is each dog in the family will make a different tone or a different pitch of howl, and that will make a specific song that's different for every family in the area. They use these songs to tell families apart from other families, so they know where one family's area is and where the other one is, and they know if you know a certain song is too loud, they're probably too close to the other family's area. So they back off and go back to their own area. This, that song, that singing, is why they went extinct in the wild. All right? I want to do a thought experiment. So we're going to imagine it's a dark night. You're sleeping in a hut with one room on a hard bed. All of your family's in the same room. There's no door on the hut. And then you hear these songs of howls, like coyotes, but they're singing and they make weird, weird noises. And you hear them coming from all directions. Would that be scary? Yeah, that'd be really scary. That's what the tribes were talking about getting. They were really scared of these guys because of how eerie their howls were. They actually thought they were evil spirits. We went and visited the island about two hundred years ago. We took a handful of them back to study and to put in zoos and things. We went back to the island of Papua New Guinea a few decades later, and they were all gone. We did some research and we found out the tribe of Papua New Guinea drove them to extinction because they thought they were evil spirits. Luckily, we had enough in captivity back in North America that we could start to breed and start to raise the population, and we're still working on that now. Hopefully, if we raise the population high enough with enough dogs, we can reintroduce them to the wild, and they won't be extinct anymore. All right? Do we have any questions about singing dogs? Yes, sir. Prehistoric. Prehistoric means before history, before we have written history of things. Um, and we found out about these guys during the time where we could write down and talk about them. So they're not prehistoric, but um, they are extinct in the wild. It would be a little bit like Jurassic Park, I guess, if we were to uh, raise enough food to reintroduce them in the wild. Probably a little bit less dangerous. Though. All right? Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. There should be. Um, there was a big movement back when we found out about the tribes and all that, but that actually slowed down a lot. These guys look almost exactly like a dingo. When they're fully grown, um, she'll be about an inch or so longer. And dingoes are about twice their size when they're fully grown, but besides that, they look very similar. The howl sounds similar, but it's not exactly the same. And a little while ago, um, a little while ago, they actually got classified as the same family, the same species of dogs as the dingoes, which meant all of the organizations that helped to raise money for that kind of thing for introducing cut the funding because dingoes aren't extinct, but the same dog is. But to them, on paper, it didn't make sense to fund the reintroduction of that kind of animal. 
So it's really slowed down, but we're still working on it. And we do plan on eventually having enough to reintroduce. Right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you said that the uh, tribes were terrified. Um, so. Can you keep an eye on this for a minute? I need to go to my back together. How we continue on, you know, with our beliefs and stuff. So has their thinking changed? They have advanced a little bit right by now. And before we reintroduce them, that would definitely be something we talk to them about. Right, because I know um, that we still believe yeah. our ancestors and how yeah. they feel with us. That would be a big part of reintroducing them. Um, and it's something we would look more into before that happens. It would definitely be a shock that they, like, hundreds of them showed up. <laughs> oh, they came back. Yeah, they're, they're probably coming, really they're scary. Us. All right. We'll do one more question about the singing dog. Yes, ma'am. Can we pet her? We had someone else ask if they were good pets. Out of all the animals today, this one looks like it would probably make the best pet. But, again, she's still very much a wild animal. We actually make sure that she doesn't get too domesticated. If these guys were to get super domesticated, like house dogs, we would never be able to successfully reintroduce them to the wild because they would still, or they would expect to be fed by humans and treated like pets, and they couldn't go back out and hunt in the wild like normal normal singing dogs did back when they existed. So no, if she doesn't make good, a good pet, if she were to get scared or spooky, she could still be very mean and aggressive. All right? Everyone say bye, Adele. Bye, Adele. Thank you all for coming. That is the last animal I have to um, If you like what you saw today, be sure to like us on Facebook. Uh, it's this logo, Animal Tales. If you didn't like what you saw, you can forget that I asked. Um, again, if you want more information, you can come get one of these cards on our website. All right? So,